I was going to dry it and save it for later, but if it gets this thing away, I'm game. The metlac hisses at me again, and it bats at my arm, its claws leaving raised welts on my arm. I bite back my yelp of shock, recoiling. I'm trying to help you, asshole, I whisper. I have to keep my voice low so I don't wake up Pacey. He's a sound sleeper like his daddy, but he's also still a baby and easily startled. The creature clutches at its side, and for a moment I think it's wounded. But then the fur wiggles and moves. And I realize this starving creature has a baby. It's a she, and it's a mom like me. I'm suddenly flooded with sympathy. The Metlac is clearly scared of the fire, and probably scared of me too, but she's desperate to eat. I'm guessing her milk is close to running dry if she's starving, and it's fear for her baby that's making her be so bold as to come into an occupied cave after food. Here, I say softly. I offer her the bulbous root and make the miming gesture for eating again. Eat. She snatches it from me and begins to sniff it. The furry bundle on her chest makes a peeping noise, not unlike a baby chick. With another wary look at me, she takes a bite directly out of the knot potato. Her eyes widen and she begins to devour it with frantic, enormous bites. And I notice, for the first time, that despite the fact that she's a vegetarian, she's got some impressive fangs. Pashoff Maybe we will spend the brutal season alone, Stacy and I. I mused this as I head back to our cave, a freshly slain Davisti slung over one shoulder. One of the many herds happened to be passing through the nearby valley, and so I followed the trails over and picked off a shaggy elder. There are many kits with the herd, and I watch them run past as the herd races away, frightened. I do not think I can kill the young any more, not with my own son so helpless and small. But now I have even more meat and a new hide for Stacy to fuss over. We will have much smoked meat and the cache is still half full. If the weather holds for a few more hands of days, like Rokan said, that will give me plenty of time to fill the cache and to dig up several of the knot potato that Stacy makes delicious things out of. With only two mouths to feed, it would be no problem for Stacy and me to ride out the brutal season alone, even if the snows last longer than usual. And it will give us more time to bond. I know my chief wants us to return sooner, but I worry it will not be enough time. I do not have my memories back yet. The ones that return are fleeting and disappear as quickly as they flicker through my mind, leaving me only with the knowledge that I did remember something. Each time it happens it fills me with a sense of loss and frustration, like I am failing both myself and my mate. She worries too, I think. There are questions in Stacy's eyes when she looks at me. She has concerns, and I think they are not just over my health. She has not yet invited me to sleep in her furs again. I am trying to be patient, but it is difficult. I think of Rook, the newcomer, and his mate Harlow. Out of all the tribe, they seem the most tightly bonded. He hovers over her obsessively, and she seems to need him as much. Harrick told me they spent the last brutal season in a cave down by the Great Salt Lake. It makes sense that they are so close. After moons and moons of time alone together, of course they are intertwined like roots. I am jealous, though. Did I have that with Stacy before? I want it back, and if it takes spending the brutal season alone with her, I am willing to do so. It will be lonely without my family and tribe nearby, but I crave closeness with my mate more than I crave my mother's herbal teas or the company of other hunters. I have not told Stacy of my plans yet. She will not like them, I suspect. She will want to return to the tribe for fear that I am still too injured to hunt. I feel fine, though. I am fit and capable. There is nothing wrong with my body, and I can only hope my memories will return in time. Until then, I must be patient. The only problem with this plan that I can see is that my chief will not be happy. Vectal said he would send a hunter out to bring us back if we did not show up at the scheduled time. I can talk a hunter into seeing the reason behind my decision, though. He will have to go back empty-handed, and by the time that happens, the brutal season will be upon us, and the weather will be too bad for others to venture after us. Stacy will be mine and mine alone throughout the cold months. I like that thought. I can hold her in my arms by the fire, and she can tell me of more memories until my mind is so full that I cannot help but be the male I once was. 
Even though I am occupied by these thoughts, I am so attuned to my mate that when I hear her voice drift outside of the cave, I stiffen. Are you done eating? I hear her murmur. Leaving soon, I hope. A bolt of jealous anger surges through me. Is one of the hunters here? Did Vectal lie to me and send someone after us sooner than he said? Is it Harak? Is he flirting with my mate even now? I'm so occupied by this that I don't notice the smell emanating from the cave. I fling the divisti down on the ground outside the cave and stalk inside. It barely registers in my mind that the privacy screen is pushed aside until I enter. And then I see the creature. It crouches near Stacy, my mate strategically blocking the entrance to the next chamber of the cave with her body. The cave is a mess, baskets of food strewn about, and as I watch, the metlack shoves a mouthful of knot potato into its maw. Crumbs and filth litter the thing's coat, and it turns to look at me, hissing its anger as I enter. All I can see is that it is too close to my mate. My precious, fragile mate. I growl at the sight. I am both shocked and full of fear that a metlack would dare to enter my cave and approach my mate. It is bigger than Stacy, for all that it is thin with hunger. The look in his eyes is dangerous, and I pull out my knife. No, Stacy calls to me, raising her hands. Don't! Pashovit has a baby! The metlack hoots angrily, slapping Stacy's arms aside. I surge forward at that, determined to protect my mate. I will kill it for touching her. It scrambles over her, a sharp cry of surprise escaping Stacy as the thing climbs over her lap and then scurries past me and the fire, rushing out the door of the cave. The smell of singed fur chokes the cave, and I realize it must have burned itself as it ran. I turn and chase after it, just long enough to make sure it does not come back. My heart is pounding in my breast, and all I can see in my mind is the creature hissing at Stacy, clawing at Stacy. My mate was in danger, and I was not here. What if I had stayed out longer? The image of the met like striking Stacy goes through my mind again, and my body goes cold with fear. What if it had harmed her, or my son? The creature races through the snow, frantically darting away from the cave. I watch it go, my knife held in my sweaty hand. I want to chase it down and ensure it does not return, but I do not want to leave Stacy unprotected again. I turn and head back to the cave, my stomach churning with unease. Inside I do not see my mate, just the destruction of the cave. Baskets are torn apart, their contents spilled. They will have to be discarded, the meat thrown away because met like our filthy creatures. It is a waste, but I do not care. All I care about is my mate. I enter the second chamber of the cave, and Stacy is there, clutching Pacey tightly to her chest. My son hiccups and begins to cry, and Stacy's cheeks are wet with tears, her eyes closed. My mate, I say, voice hoarse as I stalk toward her. I'm okay, she chokes out. Really? I just need a moment to recover. Her fingers smooth over the kit's mane, and I see her hand is trembling. I wrap my arms around her, the kit squeezed between us. It did not hurt you? Just a few scratches, Stacy tells me, shaking. Nothing big. I think it was just hungry. It had a baby, Pashov. She hugs Pacey to her, even tighter. Oh, God. I kept feeling sorry for it, and yet I was terrified it would see Pacey in his basket and hurt him. I smooth a hand down her hair. I am here. You are safe. She nods jerkily, pressing another kiss to Pacey's cheek as he wails in her ear. We're lucky, she says after a moment. Lucky all it wanted was food. I continue to stroke her hair, though I feel helpless and frustrated. They fear fire. I do not understand why this one approached. She had a baby, Stacy says with a shake of her head. She was scared of the fire, but she still came inside looking for something to eat. Maybe her tribe or her mate didn't survive the earthquake? She was starving. She focuses on me, eyes wide. You don't think it'll be back, do you? I want to reassure her, but the truth is I do not know if it will be back. If a metlack is brave enough to storm inside a cave with both fire and sakwi scent, I cannot predict if it will stay away. Metlack are cowardly creatures for all their viciousness, and usually the sight of fire or the scent of a hunter will keep them at bay. They rarely disturb hunter caves. But this one was hungry enough to confront my mate. I hold her close against me again, feeling her soft, trembling warmth. So fragile. Her and my son both. I will make a big fire tonight, I tell her, and we leave in the morning to rejoin the tribe. Stacy does not protest this. She nods and kisses Pacey's cheek again. 
I cannot endanger my family. We cannot stay here alone through the brutal season after all. I will need to hunt, and after today I will live in fear of the thought of more Metlak returning. What if that one has gone to get its tribe, and they will return tonight to steal more of our food? I wish I had killed it. Mother or not, it has put my family in danger. This place is not safe after all. We will rejoin the tribe because it will be safe for Stacy and Pacey there. I simply have to woo my mate while we are with the tribe. I want the closeness with her that we once had, but not at the risk of her life or that of my son. Their safety comes first. I press my mouth to Stacy's hair and try to calm her trembling. Tomorrow morning, I promise her, we will repack this sled and leave at dawn. What about tonight? I will not sleep tonight, I vow grimly. I will watch the fire. Chapter 10 Stacy Five Days Later Are we there yet? I tease from my spot on the sled. We are close. Pashoff's voice floats back to me. He glances over his shoulder, casting a smile in my direction. Not too much farther. I can't say I'm sorry to hear that. While we haven't had any issues with traveling, I'm more than ready to be done and settle into our new home. It's been a long week and my face still feels wind-burnt and frozen, no matter how much cream I put on it. I'm cold, tired, hungry, and physically exhausted to my bones. I feel like I could sleep for a week. Except that wouldn't be fair to Pashov, who is probably just as tired and is doing all the work. My mate is tireless. Over ridge and valley, through waist-high snow or rocky plateaus, he moves forward with sure feet and endless, bountiful strength. I'm both incredibly grateful for his stamina and a little worried at how vulnerable Pacey and I are. If anything should happen to him, we're screwed. It's just another reason why I'm so glad we're heading back to rejoin the tribe. There's safety in numbers, and as much as I enjoyed our time at the little cave, I'm ready to rejoin the tribe. I just don't know if Pashov agrees. He's been distant while we've traveled. Not in an unpleasant way, but it's clear he's holding me at arm's length. At night, we huddle together for warmth, but it never goes beyond him stroking my hair. Which, okay. I'm a little too tired to get wild with him, but at the same time, I wouldn't turn it down. I'm hungry for the closeness we used to have, but it's pretty apparent to me that I'm the only one. But I can't blame him. He pulls the sled all day long, and I'm not sure that he's sleeping at night. He's obsessed with keeping the fire built high, if nothing else, to protect us from wandering Metlak. I worry that he's going to collapse out of exhaustion, but he seems to be handling things well. Maybe it's just me who's tired and my head's spinny with worry. Pacey's fussy too, but I can't blame him. After a week of sitting around, he wants to stretch his legs. He's been good so far, but he's ready to play and get free from my arms. And after a week of holding him? I'm ready for him to be free from my arms, too. Maybe when we reunite with the tribe, Kenley can watch Pacey for a night or two, and that will give Pashov and me some time together. We'd have to work out feeding times, but it's doable, and I could steal a few hours alone with Pashov after we relax and recover a bit. I like the thought of that. Of course, we have to get there first. I gaze around the wide-open canyon we're traveling through. The rocky walls are high but distant. There's snow on the ground, but it's not as thick as it has been in other areas. In the distance, there are copses of the thin pink trees, and overhead I see a few scythe beaks flying past, cawing at each other. At the far end of the valley, there's a large dark mass moving along the snow. Divisti. This area has a little bit of everything. Too bad we can't stay here. You're sure that we're close? I ask Pashov. I don't see any signs of the tribe. Surely we'd see signs of them if we were close, wouldn't we? There was a mark on one of the trees at the entrance to the valley, he tells me. It was made by a knife. We are close. Hmm. I'm ready to be done, but I don't say that out loud. I don't want to seem like I'm griping when he's the one doing all the heavy work. I shift on the sled. How are you holding up, Pashov? Do you need to rest? No resting here, he tells me. This is Metlak territory. Best to keep moving until we find the tribe. We are close, I promise. 
I'm not sure if he's trying to convince me or himself. Still, if this is Metlak territory, it's wise to keep going. I pull the blankets around my body and hug Pacey tight. It's been days, but I still keep thinking about the Metlak mother that invaded the cave. Did she survive? Did she come back? Or did she and her baby starve to death? I suppose I won't ever know, but it makes me hold my own child a little tighter. I wish I could have done more for her, even though I was terrified of her. Maybe we should have stayed to try and help her out. Then again, what if she had come back with her entire tribe? They would have killed us without a flash of remorse and stolen our food. If I had to choose between feeding them and feeding Pacey and Pashov, I'm going to choose my men, of course. The sled stops, interrupting my endless worrying thoughts. I immediately tense. What is it? I see it, he says in a low voice, and he sounds odd. I crane my neck because I don't see anything at all, just snow and more snow. No cluster of houses, which is what I was led to expect. Where? Pashoff points ahead and I squint, wondering if I'm missing something. Then I see it a moment later. It's a gaping, dark line next to one of the cliffs. I thought it was a shadow, but I realize a moment later that the sun is facing in the wrong direction for there to be a shadow there. It's a gorge. In the ground. Maddie had said that, hadn't she? I guess I'd conveniently forgotten that we're going to be living in a valley, in another valley. I shiver at the thought, holding Pacey tighter. In the hole? Is it a hole? Pashoff chuckles. I guess it is. The look he casts in my direction is boyish with excitement. Let us go see it, yes? Like we have a choice. I smile, though I'm not sure I'm excited about this. That hole looks ominous and deep, and it's triggering my fear of heights like crazy. But it's not like there's anywhere else to go, is there? It'll be fine, Stace. Pashov is here. I take a deep breath and keep smiling until I relax a little. It can't be as bad as it looks. Pashov begins to pull the sled again, his steps quicker, as if the sight of our destination has rejuvenated him. I settle back in my seat, tucking the blankets back around Pacey. It's grown colder every day, even though the weather is clear, and that means we don't have much longer until the brutal season rains down endless tons of snow on us. It's good that we're arriving now because I don't have the same trust in Rokon's weather sense that the others do. I'm worried about getting caught in a blizzard. If it's this nasty when the weather's nice, it's going to be truly awful when it turns. Before, it wasn't so bad because we were tucked away in a safe, warm cave with a heated pool and enough room for everyone. This time, I shudder, looking at that dark shadow ahead. This time, the brutal season's going to be very... Very different. Someone is coming, Pajov calls out. I look ahead, trying to see around his big shoulders. It takes me a moment to focus in on the small, dark blue object that seems to emerge from the ground. It's startling to see, and even more startling when I realize just how tiny that blue blob is compared to the gorge. It's huge. My stomach gives a queasy little flip. Horek my mate says in a curiously flat voice. Of course. We're still a fair distance away, and I can barely squint to make out features. Maybe it's Harak, maybe not. Pashov's vision is better than mine if he can tell at this distance. You think he heard us coming? No, it is probably just luck. He doesn't sound pleased, either. A moment later, a second figure emerges, and Pashov adds, Beck too. They are probably leaving to hunt. He raises a hand in the air. Ho! Oh! I wince as my mate's loud voice booms over the valley. Pacey gives a startled cry and begins to whine, and I hug him close, tucking him under my tunic in case he wants to comfort nurse. Oh! One of the distant figures calls back, raising a tiny hand in the air. A few minutes later, Beck and Harak both jog up to our sled. Harak's grinning broadly, but Beck is as solemn as ever. He rarely smiles, and today doesn't seem like it's going to be one of those days, even though he gives Pashov a friendly clap on the shoulder. It is good to see you again, my friend. And you, Pashov says. 
It has been a long journey. How is the new home? Different, Harex chimes in, but good. It is a strange place, but there is plenty of room, and we are sheltered from the winds. He moves around to my side. Stacy, how are you faring? Hi, Harek. I'm good. And your little one? Pacey's currently latched to my breast, and I don't pull him out to show Harek, even though I know he enjoys playing with the babies of the tribe. He's been very patient with all the travel. I smile. It's good to see more people again. How is everyone? It suddenly feels like we've been gone forever, not less than two weeks. Everyone is settling in, Harek says, even as Beck moves to the handles of the sled and begins to pull it, giving my maid a rest. Harek steps in next to the sled, chatting with me. The biggest problem was figuring out who would live where, the hunter tells me with an amused look. Everyone wants to be closest to the big bathing pool in the center of the village. Village? I ask. As I say the word aloud, I realize what it is. Oh, village. Yes, Harek says. The humans say we should call it crow a -on. It was Lise's idea. I sound the word out in my head. crow a -on. Oh, Jesus. It takes me a moment to realize where I've heard that word before. The lost colony of Roanoke. When the ships had returned to bring supplies to the colony, they found it deserted, and the only clue to where they had gone was the word Croatoan carved into a tree. Liz sure is morbid. Sure she did not like it either, but it is the name we are using, he shrugs. Is it bad? It's fine, I lie, though I'm a little creeped out by the name. I'm more concerned with my mate. He's silent, just like Beck. And while that's pretty normal for Beck, Pashov's normally a more laughing, friendly sort. He doesn't seem to be pleased right now, and I wonder if he's worried about our new home, too. Why does everyone want to be closest to the bathing pool? I ask absently. The floors are warm there. Harak gives me a smug nod. It feels good on the feet. Oh, wow. I've heard of such things back home, but having a thermal floor here seems like a ridiculous luxury. I can see why everyone was fighting over it. Do not worry, Harek says. Sure she has made sure you will have a good house. He says the word strangely, like it fits funny in his mouth. I guess it does, considering everyone has lived in caves up until now. Harek looks over at Pashoff and elbows him. You can bunk with us hunters, eh? I wait for Pashoff to protest, to say that he's going to stay with me. Pashoff only nods. Good. And just like that, I'm hurt. Beyond hurt. In front of his friends, he's basically pushing me aside? What the heck happened? I thought we were reconnecting. And all he can say about not staying with me is good? I'm silent for the rest of the journey. The talk turns to Metlak, and Pashov tells the others how the starving one invaded our cave. Beck and Harak make concerned noises, as this is clearly unheard of. Harak tells us that, despite this being Metlak territory, they have not been seen since we arrived. Beck speculates that they have left this area for another, but it is too early yet to tell. The hunting is good in this area, with many divisti herds and lots of scythe beaks. The next valley over is full of not potato trees, and the chief is quite pleased with the new home. And I only listen with a half an ear, because in my head, all I hear is Pashoff's voice. Good. You are staying with the hunters. Good. Why is that good? I don't understand. Here we are, Harak declares as Beck stops the sled. Harak holds a hand out to help me down. Pashoff pushes him aside, growling, Leave Stacy alone. The hunter merely laughs and shrugs, ignoring the dark looks that both Beck and Pashoff give him. I'm mystified by this reaction. Harak has always been a close friend of Pashov's. Why the sudden dislike for him now? Is something else going on that I'm unaware of? Has he forgotten his friendship with Harak? Cold sinks into my belly at the thought. Is this why Pashov is distant? He's forgetting more and more? It's a good thing you are back then, I tell myself, trying not to panic. The healer is here. She will know what to do. I hope. Pashoff takes Pacey from me and helps me down off the sled. 
It feels good to stretch my legs, but I can't help but stare at the gorge, the edge of which we are standing far too close to. Did they say this thing was a valley? It looks more like the Ice Age version of the Grand Canyon. I shiver at the sight of it and move closer to my mate. And this appeared out of nowhere after the earthquake? Beck grunts. Someone says it may have been covered with thick ice and that the ice broke during the earthquake. That must have been some damn ice. How... how deep is this? Oh, many, many hands deep, Harak says cheerfully. The Metlak and Snowcats do not dare come down here because they will not be able to get back up. That... doesn't make me feel much better. How do we get down? Rope, Harak declares, gesturing at a spot on the edge. There's a rock jutting up near the lip of the canyon, and I can see a loop of rope around it leading down. I take a step closer to the edge and immediately get dizzy. It's deep. Oh, God, really deep. I whimper and jerk backward, flinging myself into Pashov's embrace. Shh, he murmurs, stroking my hair. What is it? Harak asks. I can't speak. I'm panting, terrified. My heart is hammering in my chest and my entire body tingles with fear. I can't do it. I can't. It's too far to fall. It is nothing, Pashoff says. Can you unload the sled while I speak to my mate? They get to work and Pashoff steers me gently away from them and the edge. Be calm, my mate. I press my hand to my mouth, only to feel my fingers trembling wildly. Did I mention that I'm scared of heights? I say with a nervous laugh. Because I am. Really, really afraid. Can't we walk down? If there was a way to walk down, I do not think they would use the rope, Pashoff says, his voice hinting at amusement. It will be all right, I promise, and you will only have to do this once. He strokes my cheek. After that... You will be safe and you will be home. Oh, sure. Easy for him to say. I shiver, trying to erase the mental image of the yawning gorge out of my brain. I can't stay up here. I have to go down. Have to. At the bottom is the village and people and safety. I just have to get there. I don't think I can climb and carry Pacey at the same time, I tell him. I will carry him. Pashov says easily. He continues to stroke my cheek, doing his best to soothe my panic. Will that make you feel better? An elevator would make me feel better, I say with a watery, nervous laugh. I'm trying not to lose my cool, but it's hard. All I want to do is turn around and run, which is stupid. We've traveled so far, and there's nothing to go back to. I try to look over at the canyon again, and the sick feeling clenches in my belly once more. I think I need a minute to prepare. He nods and presses a kiss to my forehead. I will help them unload. Can you hold Pacey until we are ready? I take my baby back and hug him close, ignoring his little cry of protest at my tight squeezing. The wind picks up and whips my leather tunic around my body, and I shiver, imagining the earth underneath my feet moving like it did in the earthquake. It feels very fragile and unstable here on the edge of the cliff, but that just might be my imagination. I feel like if I lean too far over to one side, I will tip over the edge and tumble into the ravine, which is crazy considering I'm standing about twenty feet away from the side, but I can't help the way I feel. I watch as the three hunters unload the sled, casually tossing bundle after bundle of furs down to the bottom of the gorge. They fling things over with abandon, and then Beck grabs the rope and climbs down after. Harak helps Pashoff dismantle the sled, and they toss down the long bones, which will be reused for other things, because the Sakwi waste nothing. Harak then disappears over the ledge, and then it's just me and Pashoff and Pacey up here. Pashoff turns to me. You go first. I do not like the thought of you up here alone while I am down below. He holds his arms out for the baby. Let us put my son and his carrier on my back, and I will climb down after you. 
I nod, trying to hold back my nervousness, even though the urge to throw up is growing stronger by the moment. I don't like this. I don't like the thought of Pacey going down the gorge either, but I know that's just my anxiety speaking. He's going to be perfectly safe on Pashov's back, because Pashov won't let anything happen to him. I tuck Pacey into the carrier and triple-check the straps. The baby's in a good mood, waving his little fists in the air and babbling happily to himself. I wish I could be so carefree. I check the straps one more time and realize I'm stalling. There's nothing I can do now except go down the rope. I suck in a deep breath. Pashoff turns to me and cups my cheeks in his warm, warm hands. You will be fine. When I give a slow nod, he continues. Take off your mittens so you can grip the rope tightly. Move as slowly as you need to. Brace your feet on the wall to help you move. Got it. I breathe. I move forward to the edge of the cliff and grab the rope. There are knots tied every few feet, so it makes it easier to climb up and down, but my hands are shaking so badly and my palms are so sweaty that I nearly drop the rope. Stacy. I'm fine, I tell him. Really, I can do this. I grip the rope again and then peer over the edge. There's a scatter of bundles down on the snowy ground below, and Harak and Beck are walking away, burdened with our things. I can't stop staring at the ground, though. It's at least twenty or thirty feet down, though my brain gets a little woozy at the sight. Twenty feet might as well be a hundred. It's also a completely sheer drop. I wiggle one foot closer to the edge and try to figure out how to get my feet braced on the wall like Pashov said. My hands slip and my foot does too. My body skids backward. Suddenly I'm flat on my stomach on the ledge, my legs dangling in midair over the lip of the canyon. A terrified whimper escapes me. No, Pashov cries out. No, Stacy, stop. His hands grip my upper arms and he hauls me back over the ledge. Stop, he tells me again. There must be another way. I'm sorry, I say, trembling. I cling to his neck, burying my face against his chest as he holds me tight. I'm trying. I know. He strokes my hair. I know. Let me think. I cling to him. I wish I wasn't so afraid of heights. You are who you are. Make no apologies for it. He presses a kiss to my forehead. I would change nothing about you. He always knows what to say to make me feel better. I burrow against him, clinging to his big, strong body. He might not want to change anything, but I do wish I wasn't such a coward. Hold still, he tells me after a moment, and I feel his hands go around my waist. He pulls at the wide leather belt I wear and tugs it off. Surviving on the ice planet, for humans, anyhow, is all about layers, and I tend to wear several furs and then belt them tightly around my waist, going over it twice. That way, the furs catch no wind and don't let a cold breeze in. He takes my belt and ties my waist to his, cinching the length of leather through the bone circle so we are roped together. Pashoff takes my hand and puts it on his shoulder. Arms around my neck and hold me tightly. What are we doing? You are holding on to me, he says, and I am going to get us both down. But he's already got Pacey. I'm going to be a dead weight on his front, and that's going to make it hard for him to climb. Pashov, I don't know. I do. Hold on to me, he says, and hitches me up a few feet off the ground, so now my feet are dangling. I give a little whimper of fear and cling to his neck. He's not leaving me with much choice. Keep your eyes closed. Pashov, I cry out when I feel his body shift. I'm scared. Do not open your eyes, then, he tells me. I have you. Don't let me fall. Never. Trust in me, Stacy. I feel his big body flex as he moves. Oh, God, is he climbing down already? I fling my legs around his waist and cling to him with all my might. I try to focus on everything but the fact that I can feel his body sway or that I can feel him grunt with exertion, that I can feel the muscles in his arms straining. Pacey babbles happily to himself, the burbling nonsense syllables sounding loud and uneven as they echo off the canyon walls. Then, 
Pashov's body thumps hard, and I feel the impact of it move through my body as well. I swallow a nervous little scream. He pats my back. We are down, my mate. We, we are? My eyes are still tightly squeezed shut. Yes, you can stand on your own now. To his credit, he sounds very patient and not annoyed with me at all. I dare to open one eye and glance around. I see nothing but ice and shadow, and I look down. Sure enough, Pashoff's big furry boots are planted firmly on the snow. I slide one leg down off of him and feel solid ground beneath my feet. I burst into tears. Come now, my mate soothes, cupping my face. It's not so bad as that, is it? I'm just relieved, I tell him between tears. All the frantic, nervous energy being sapped right out of me through my tear ducts. I feel drained. I rest my face against his chest, sniffling. I'm sorry I'm such a mess. You are not a mess. We all have fears. I want to ask what he's afraid of, but I know the answer. I think of his nightmares, always about cave-ins. Well, that particular fear is justified. I can't blame him for that. His hands slide to my butt and he cups it. Besides, he teases, I got to enjoy your legs around my waist, and now I get to put my hands on this round bottom of yours. He pats it, teasing. No tail. So strange. I hold my breath. That... That's our old joke. He always grabs my butt and makes cracks about my lack of a tail. I wait hoping he's going to say something else, that he'll remember more. But he just gives my butt one final pat. Come, let us get to the new home place and see what your house will look like. My house. Not his. Not ours. Mine. I don't know what to think. Man, talk about mixed signals. Pashov. This place is nothing like I had imagined. I have lived my entire life in the sheltering walls of the tribal cave, and even though I have been told what this village should look like, my mind pictured it differently. I could not envision a place where so much stone is so neatly set together. The stone under our feet locks together like fat fingers dusted by snow. It feels hard on the boots, and I wonder why anyone would set stone in the ground like this with such regularity. Cobblestones, Stacy murmurs as she comes to my side. Nice, is it? It feels strange under my feet. What are they for? Um, Stacy gives me a strange look. To make roads? Floors? To keep the ground even, so it doesn't get slushy or muddy? And it's good for wheels, she nudges me. I don't think you guys are up to wheels yet. But you have seen this before? Oh, yeah, mostly in older cities, but I've seen it. She seems relaxed and comfortable at the sight. I wonder what the houses will look like. I am curious about this as well. I gaze around us. The crevasse walls grow higher as we walk forward, and they block out a lot of the sunlight. The shadows make it colder down here, and I worry my mate will suffer. I hold my worries back, though, because Stacy seems excited. After the trouble getting down here, I do not want to take her back out of the valley. Not if there are Metlak up there. She will be safest with the tribe. The crevasse winds around and splits. We turn a corner, and there ahead I see the village. It is so strange. Squat piles of rocks form regular small caves neatly lined up in a way that looks unnatural and makes my mind hurt to see. Some are topped by leather suspended by poles until it forms a high triangle of sorts that points up at the sky. Smoke rises from a few different leather triangles, and I see people walking between the little standalone caves. Oh, wow, Stacy breathes at my side, clutching my arm. Check it out. They look like teepees on top of walls. I wonder who thought to do that. I will ask, I tell her. If it is important, I will find out for her. I'm sure we'll find out. She continues to hold on to me as we walk forward. Her eyes are wide and she can't stop staring. It looks like everyone's setting up in the small houses. I wonder what the big one is for. She gestures, and at the far end of the rows of houses, there is a larger stone building, still with no top to it. Maddie said there was a pool there, right? I believe so. Stacy! 
An excited squeal erupts from one of the teepee houses as we pass it. It is Josie, the chattery one. She springs out, practically dancing with excitement. You guys are here. That's wonderful. I'm so excited to see you. Josie, Stacy calls out, extending her arms. The smaller one flings herself at my mate and the two women hug. How was the trip here? Did everyone make it all right? We did. It was great. Josie beams at me. Making our way down was a little hairy, but Harlow's talking about setting up a pulley and a lift of some kind. I haven't seen her this motivated since the earthquake. My mate gives Josie a gentle smile. It's been hard for her. The ship was her baby. Where's the chief? I interrupt. He will want to know we have arrived. I think he's out hunting with a few of the others. Gotta get in the last minute brutal season supplies and all that. She shrugs. We'll find Georgie and let her know you guys are here, though, and she can pass it on. Josie snaps her fingers and then waves her hands in the air, all excitement. Oh, wait! You guys need to see your house. Our house? Someone picked out one for us? Stacy looks at me. I am crestfallen when I realize she must be waiting for me to correct Josie. I will be staying with the hunters, I volunteer. Both women stare at me. What? I ask. Stacy gives a little shake of her head and turns back to Josie. Will you show us where the house is? I'd love to see it. Of course. She licks her arm with Stacy's and leads her forward. It's over here in the center of town. You guys weren't here, and the floors are warmer closer to the main lodge. That's the big building on the end there. And so we thought it'd only be fair if we drew numbers out of a basket to see who got to pick first. You ended up being number three, and Georgie picked for you guys. She beams at my mate. You've got a fantastic house. Mine's on the outskirts, but I don't really mind, because Haydn says it means that I'm that much closer to him when he comes home from hunting, and you know how much I miss him when he goes out. She sighs. I stop listening as Josie starts to go on and on about how impressive and wonderful her mate is. The female chatters like she will run out of air if she stops, but Stacy does not seem to mind. She glances back at me every now and then, but seems content to let Josie lead her forward. I gaze around the village. To the back of the cluster of dwellings, I see Hamalo helping my brother Zenek and his mate set up their teepee atop their cave. Two human females are walking to the big lodge, holding a conversation, with their kits on their hips. I can hear the murmur of voices and the sounds of hammering. Somewhere in the maze of stone that is now our home, a kit cries. It feels very strange to be in this place and realize this is home. So, Croatoan? For real? That's what we're calling this place? My mate says, and I am drawn back to the conversation and her sweet voice. Who came up with that? Who else? Liz? Josie gives a little snort. But you have to admit, it does fit. The whole abandoned village and mystery thing. I guess. I still think it's spooky. Do we know who was here before us, then? Did they leave any clues? A few, Josie says. I'll show you when we get to your house. Come on, we're almost there. You're going to be next to Maddie and Hassan. I like them, Stacy says in a quiet voice. Psh, you like everyone. It is true. My mate does not have an unkind bone in her body. I am pleased that Josie leads us up through the main section of the cave. I will always somehow think of our home as a cave, even if it is not, and am doubly pleased to see that the houses here are firm and steady. The stones are neatly stacked in their little rows as they make up the walls, and Josie points out Madi and Hassan's dwelling, which is already covered with a large hide that seems to be Sokotsk and a few divisti hides sewn to it. A small plume of smoke rises from their dwelling, and I watch a curl of it rise, only to be carried away by the wind. Smoke in my eyes is one thing I will not miss about the cave. But with no protection from the weather, I do not see how this will be safe for my Stacy and my son. Here we go, Josie calls out. Home, sweet home. She gestures at the doorway of the house next to Madi and Hassan's dwelling. Georgie picked you out a good one. I'll have to tell her thank you my mate says, letting go of Josie's arm and wandering into her new home. She touches the wall. The bricks are tight together. Mortared, Josie says. No cracks let the wind in. You might have to plug a few, but otherwise it's pretty snug, which is nice. It is. The stone helps keep the heat from the fire in, too. It's pretty spiff. Stacy brightens. That seems nice. Her hand caresses the bricks again, and I realize both she and Josie seem very small next to the wall. This is not a human-sized dwelling, then. Was this made by Sakui? I ask. I don't think so, Josie says, stepping farther into the house. You guys crashed here like 300 years ago, right? This is way older than that. It's so old that the roof's rotted off. 
She gestures at the open air. Ariana said she was studying archaeology in college and that a lot of the ruins would look like this. The roof was made out of something that rotted away, and all we have left is the stonework. Curious. I follow them in and notice the stones on the floor are even and hard here, too. The walls are all covered with a thin layer of ice that will make things slippery and cold. This ice will have to be removed. Yeah, it's not on the floors because they stay warm. If you take your shoes off, you'll notice it. Well, I don't know if you'll want to take them off right now. Kind of needs sweeping in here. But in general. Josie gestures at the wall, stepping over to one side. But let me show you this. Stacy glances over at me and follows Josie over. What is it? Carvings, Josie says. All of the houses have a few. Some of them are more detailed than others. You can just barely make it out under the ice. She slides a hand over the ice, as if trying to wipe it away. Stacy leans in and squints. I move to my mate's side, curious if it looks anything like Ayahako's carvings. Ayahako likes to carve swirls and soft shapes into bone. These carvings are nothing like his. Hard and angular. It seems to be made of all sharp edges, just like this village. I do not realize what I am looking at until Stacy gasps. Is that a person? I lean in and stare at the carving a bit closer. It does not look like a person. It looks like blocky lines. Blocky lines leading to more blocky lines. Where? Here, Stacy says. It's pretty stylized, but I guess these are legs and the head and... She gestures at four of the lines. I guess these are arms? Four arms? Unless they're two tails, Josie says, amused, and they grow out of shoulders. It's hard to say, considering it's little more than a stick figure, but it's kind of cool, huh? Weird. Stacy runs her hand along the ice, peering at the wall. These down here aren't people, though. They almost look like trees. Human trees. Yeah, Josie says, and there's a wistful note in her voice. We've been talking about that. There's a couple of critters that no one's ever seen drawn on another wall. Big, round, roly-poly things with long noses, which kind of made us speculate if we're in the middle of an ice age here. Maybe these people lived here in warmer times and left when it got too cold. But where did they go? She shrugs. Your guess is as good as mine. None of this conversation makes sense to me. Ice has always been here. There is no place anyone can go that does not have ice, I point out. I believe you. Stacy says. She turns to Josie and clasps her hands. All right, show me the toilet. Stacy seems very pleased with the house. She exclaims happily over the toilet, the small area in the back with the lip of stone she says will be perfect for a kitchen and does not seem to mind that there is no top to her cave yet. Himalo comes by to speak to us, and we discuss the number of hides needed and the bones that must be used to support the dwelling's lid. Then suddenly it seems as if the entire tribe stops by to say hello. People stream in, hugging Stacy and myself, and my mother takes little Pacey, declaring that we need time to unpack and relax, and she will take care of him. Kimley does not realize that I will not be staying with Stacy. Even though things are no longer uneasy between us, my mate still has not asked me to come and live with her. She has not invited me to her bed. She has not accepted me as her mate once more. Until that time, I must wait patiently, and if it means living with the unmated hunters until then, so be it. But I will make sure my mate has everything she needs to be comfortable. I will not neglect her again. Chapter 11 Stacy The wind howls high above the canyon. One of the strange things about living here at Croatoan is that the wind whistles and hums all day long. It's an endless white noise, and it takes some getting used to after the quiet of the cave. I like it, though. It drowns out the small noises of living in a tribe. Like the sex. Jesus, Maddie and Hassan are loud. I can hear them in my house over and over again. Several times a night. Every night. On days like that, I hope for high wind because our little huts are awfully close together and hearing that sort of thing makes me feel awkward and lonely. I miss Pashov. I miss him so much. For the last few days, he's been staying with the hunters at night. He shows up every morning for breakfast and I feed him and pamper him and we talk and it's wonderful. It's almost like we're mates again. He talks to me about his day, plays with Pacey, then kisses me senseless until he has to go out hunting. He returns at night, and we share a dinner together, more kisses and cuddles. 
and then he leaves to go stay with the other hunters. I won't lie. It's really messing with my mind. I don't know what to do. Should I complain? Is there something else going on that he doesn't want me to know about? Is it his nightmares? I worry about him. I worry about him and I miss him fiercely when he's gone. Even though I like the hut I'm now in, it doesn't quite feel like home when he's not here. Other than that, though, Croatoan is really dang nice. Despite the abandoned city's initial creepiness, I'm getting used to the place. I like the stone walls because they keep the heat in. I like the teepee top of the house because it lets the smoke out. I love the little kitchen area that makes it easier to prepare food. There's no dishwasher or fridge, of course, but there's a long stone counter and a basin I can use as a sink, and those are awesome. Most of all, I love my toilet and the cushionless stool that Pashov rigged over it so I don't have to squat. It's the small things that make a house a home, and I never thought I'd be so dang happy over a toilet, but I am. It's a little odd being in a standalone house after living in a central cave system with the others for so long, but the lodge roof is coming along nicely, and we've taken to gathering there during the daytime. There's a pump near the pool that's been repaired thanks to Harlow's ingenuity, and now we can pump fresh warm water instead of melting snow. The pool itself feels warmer than the old one in our cave, but it also seems to be fed by a current of some kind which makes it easy to do laundry at one end of the pool and not muddy the waters for the bathers at the other end. There's room enough for a fire and gatherings, and Pacey's had several playdates with Nora's twins and Ariana's fussy little Annalee. Even Asha's been showing up to hang out and play with the babies, and I don't mind her babysitting because it lets me do a bit of housework without having to watch Pacey constantly. Really, everything is great. Sort of. It's just me and Pashoff that can't seem to get it together. Have I somehow offended him? Or is he tired of being around us constantly? Does he not want to be a father and a mate to me, and he's trying to let us off the hook slowly? Maybe, maybe he just doesn't want me anymore. Maybe he's no longer feeling the connection between us and is trying to extricate himself. I don't know, and it's driving me crazy. I climb out of my furs and pad over to Pacey's basket. The floors are deliciously warm, and I can actually go around barefoot in my own house. It's nice. I pick the baby up and give him a kiss. Good morning, little man. Someone coughs on the other side of the privacy screen over my doorway. Is it Pashov? A flicker of annoyance moves through me. Why won't he enter? It's his home, too, even if he doesn't want to be here. Holding Pacey close, I move to the entrance and peer out. The brief patch of skin I can see through the cracks near the door tells me it's not Pashoff, and I'm still in my sleep tunic. Eep. Who is it? Harek, may I come in? Pashoff's friend? I hurry back over to my pallet of furs to dress, setting Pacey down on the blankets. Is something wrong? I call out. While it hasn't been unusual in the past for Harak to come by and visit, it's early. Is there something wrong with Pashov? My heart beats a little faster. I wanted to see if you had some of those tasty little nut potato cakes you used to make at the fire. I am tired of eating dried meat. I exhale with relief. It's not a problem. He's just hungry and a bachelor. Harak has no family to feed him. Give me two minutes to dress. I bind my leaky breasts and fling on my favorite tunic and leggings. Pacey seems restless, but not so irritated that I can't start breakfast for someone else. I head over to the screen and pull it back, inviting him in. Come inside. I need to stoke the fire. Harak pats his flat belly and beams a smile at me. He's wearing a fur wrap over his shoulders, and his long hair is tied into one thick braid that bounces against his arm as he moves inside. You are a good female, Stacy. Thanks, I say dryly. Keep an eye on Pacey, will you? I'll get food started. I don't mind cooking for him or any other of the hunters that show up. I enjoy feeding people. He bounds over to my furs where Pacey is crawling around and scoops the baby up. I hear Pacey's delighted giggle and smile to myself as I stoke the fire. 
Harak is one of the quirkier tribe's mates. He's a hunter, but at the sight of his own blood, faints dead away. He's got a weird sense of humor, but he's also got a kind heart and likes kids. This little one has a messy loincloth, Harak announces. Shall I change him? You would be my hero if you did, I say. Once the fire is blazing again, I spear my last clod of divisity dung and toss it on to keep things blazing, then head over to my little kitchen. I pull out a small knot potato from my basket of roots and chop it with my bone knife. I can't stop thinking about Pashov, though. A bolt of longing shoots through me, and I decide that I'll make double the breakfast cakes for when he shows up. If he shows up. Gosh, I really hope he shows up. I glance over at Harak, and he's changing the baby, making silly faces for him as he does. Where's Pashov this morning? Man, that did not sound casual at all. So much for keeping my cool. Oh, I am sure he will be here soon once he hears I am here. I glance over. That's a weird thing to say. Why's that? Because I am trying to make him jealous, of course. He grins at me and swings Pacey into his arms. What better way than to come and flirt with his mate and play with his kit? I chop a little faster, irritated. Is that what this is about? He's come to flirt? Hate to break it to you, but I am not interested. Oh, I know this. Harek laughs, playing with Pacey some more. You are my friend's mate, and I would never do such a thing. But he does not know this. What on earth is he talking about? He's such an odd duck. I frown as I grab a bit of dried meat and mince it, but he says nothing else, just plays with Pacey. Maybe I misheard him. I move toward the fire and put the little cakes on my scorched bone plate. It's not holding up well against the repeated use in the fire, but without my skillet, I don't have another option. No sooner does it start to sizzle than Pashoff peeks in through the doorway. I smell cakes, he asks, a delighted look on his face. That delight changes to a thunderous frown when he sees Harak. Good morning to you, Harak calls out, bouncing Pacey on his knee. Enjoying our fine weather. Pashov enters and moves near the fire, his eyes narrow. The weather is poor. Is it? I ask. It's so hard to tell here in the canyon. The little city is insulated from the worst of the snows, and apparently they have been raging pretty hard lately. All we get is the occasional sprinkle of drifting snow and the incessant howling above. Pashov nods, moving to sit next to the fire. I don't miss that he's sitting between myself and Harak. I'm a little surprised and irritated by that. Does he truly think I would show any interest in his friend? All I want is him. The first cake is ready, and I plate it, then offer it to Pashov. He looks surprised, but gives me a grateful smile, then scarfs it down. Between bites, he glances over at Harak. Are you hunting today? Of course. Harak blows a raspberry on Pacey's belly. I just wanted to get fed first. Pashoff grunts and then looks over at me. It is good. Thank you. I nod and feel like blushing a little, but I get to work on the next cake, slathering it with a bit of fat so it'll cook up tasty. They discuss the game in the area and the fact that no one has seen a Metlax since we arrived. I don't mind if the Metlax are completely gone and say so, though I do think about the mother with her little baby every now and then. Eventually, all the cakes are made and both hunters fed. Pacey starts to get fussy, so I hand the last cake over to Pashov and put the baby to my breast. Pashov sets his little plate down, watching me. Not hungry, Harak asks, reaching for the plate. I will take that. Pashov slaps his hand away. This is for Stacy. She has not eaten. Hmm, Harak says, an amused smile on his face. I'm surprised and a little touched that Pashov would save one of his cakes for me. He loves them fiercely and can eat them by the dozen. You go ahead, I tell him. I'm fine with a bit of dried meat. Pashoff shakes his head, stubborn. It is for you. He nudges the plate closer to me. What will you do today? Me? I shrug. Some more sewing, I think. Pacey's growing so big that his tunics barely fit, and I need to line them with fur since it's getting colder. Do you have enough leather? I can bring you some skins if you like, Harek volunteers. 
Pashov shoots him another irritated look, and I'm mystified. These two used to be good friends. Why does Harak seem obsessed with needling him? I'm good, I tell Harak. Thank you. I turn to Pashov. But I could use some more dung chips for the fire. I'm burning the last one right now. I will gather you some, Pashov says, leaning in and putting his hand on my knee. There's a hint of a smile on his face as he glances down at Pacey, nursing at my breast. No need, Harak interrupts, surging to his feet. There is an entire wall of dirt beaks on the far side of the canyon. We've been harvesting their nests. There are so many of them that the birds do not notice, and one good-sized nest can burn all day long. Dirt beaks? I ask. What the heck are those? Bad eating, Pashov says, making a face. You do not want to taste one. No one is going to eat the dirt beaks, Harak says, amused. We just want their nests. Shall I show you both? It is not so far from here. Is it dangerous? I ask. I am not a fan of the thought of being so close to an entire wall of bird nests. But it surely can't be dangerous, or someone would have said something earlier, right? If it's not dangerous, well, I'm curious to see these harvestable nests that will make good fuel. Also, I have to admit I'm curious what a dirt beak looks like. Dirt beaks, Harak snorts. <laughs> Dangerous, not likely. I look at Pashov. He shrugs, indicating that it's my choice. I wouldn't mind seeing them, I say. Let me finish feeding Pacey, then I can see if Asha can watch him for a bit. I can take him to her while you get your boots and cloak. Pashov leans in and traces a finger down Pacey's chubby cheek. His hand is so close I half expect him to touch my breast, but he doesn't. And then, of course, I'm disappointed. What I wouldn't give to be groped. Asha is all too happy to watch my son, and I set off with the two hunters. We are joined by Farley, who is walking her pet, Chompy. She jogs to Pashov's side and gives her brother an adoring look. He hugs her and rumples her hair, and my mood lightens at the sight of their affection. It's not a bad walk. We wander through the twisting, narrow valley of the canyon, and I marvel at just how deep it is and how the wind howls above, but we're barely touched by it down here. It's definitely colder, and the weather looks dreary above, but it's not uncomfortable. Maybe this brutal season won't be too bad. Not if we're shielded from the snow and there's an easy fuel source to grab nearby. The canyon winds away from Croatoan, snaking in a few different directions. Stay to the left, Harak instructs us as we walk. If you get separated, just turn around, put your right hand on the wall, and follow it back to the village. Got it, I say, and pick up the pace. I don't intend on getting separated. No one is leaving my sight, not even Chompy. After about fifteen minutes of walking, I start to hear... birds. Not just one or two, but dozens. Hundreds. It sounds like the birdhouses at the zoo I last went to. Caw after caw layering in on each other so loud that even the wind howling above us can't drown it out. I slide a little closer to Pashov and put my hand on his tunic. He encircles my waist with his arm and gives me a smile, and some of my tension eases. Even though there's a ton of noise, I'm still not prepared for the sight of the dirt beaks. When we enter the side canyon, it's like being hit with a wall of them. The stink of bird poop smacks you in the face, and the cawing and hooting gets even louder. From floor to ceiling, they cover one of the icy walls of the canyon, fluffy white birds nesting in crevices and on shallow lips of rock. There has to be thousands of nests, all piled on top of one another covering the wall. About a third of the nests are empty, and the ones that are occupied are inhabited by fat, adorable-looking balls of snowy white fluff with brown, triangular beaks. Each bird squats over its nest, occasionally shaking its feathered wings and calling out to its neighbors. They're so damn cute, I tell the others. How come we don't eat them? I mean, I don't think I mind because they're adorable, but it seems strange to me to have this many birds roosting and not want to toss a few of them into the stew pot. Farley makes a face. Not good eating, Pashov says again. Look closer at their nests. I do, though I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be looking at. The nests look like they're made of mud and form perfect little cups on the side of the canyon wall. 
I'm about to ask what I should be searching for when a bird flutters in and arrives at her nest. She's got something big and round in her little beak, something far larger and fatter than she should be able to carry. I realize a moment later that it's a divisti dung patty. My jaw drops. I watch as the bird flies to its nest and begins to pick the patty apart with its little beak, reinforcing its nest with what can only be a mix of bird poop and divisti poop. Lovely. That's not a dirt nest at all. It's a shit nest. Well, that explains the smell, I say faintly. They are not good eating. Pashov tells me again. They can be eaten if starving, but the meat tastes unpleasant. But the nests do burn for a long time. I see. I'd hate to take a nest that's occupied, though. I study the wall of calling, flapping birds. God, there really are so very many of them. How come only some are in use? Dirt beaks made for life, Harak says. The female will lay an egg and the male will cover it. The female feeds him. Poor female birds, always having to feed the men, I tease. There's a good analogy for you. When all three of them stare blankly at me, I clear my throat. Um, so what happens if there's no mate? Harak shrugs. The egg does not hatch. Ooh. So there could be a bunch of eggs up there in empty nests because the female doesn't have a mate? Pashov gives me a speculative look. Do you want me to check for you? Oh, God, do I ever. Eggs are my favorite food in the world. Can we? I mean, if there's one in a nest that's been abandoned, it's probably frozen, but I could thaw it. And then scramble it, or fry it, or use it to cook up a potato and meat quiche. And now I'm drooling. My mate nods firmly. I shall get you an egg and a nest. The old nests are at the bottom, Farley chimes in. You might have to look to the top. Harek snorts. He cannot climb nearly as high as me. I will get an egg for you, Stacy. Pashov shoots him a black look. You will not. She is my mate, and I will get her an egg. He points at Harak. From the top. I glance up at the wall. Guys, that's kind of high. I don't know if that's a great idea. But the two men are ignoring me, locked in their own weird pissing war. They stare at each other, Harek's expression challenging and Pashov's angry. From the top, Harek repeats. All the way to the top, Pashov agrees and storms forward. I shoot an uneasy look at Farley, but she just rolls her eyes. If she's not worried, I guess I shouldn't be. I watch as Pashov storms up to the wall of birds. I expect them to fly away, but they only squawk and flutter their wings at him. They're either going to give him a fight or they're too lazy to retreat. Pashov grins over at me, and it's clear he thinks it's the latter. Maybe he's right, and the birds are harmless. He would know. I relax a little. Pashov loves to have fun, but he wouldn't let things go too far. He begins to climb, each hand anchoring to rock, then he hauls his body up. He's surprisingly graceful for his size and I watch his tail flick back and forth as he moves. Pashov is nimble and scales up the cliff quickly, heading to the first nest, which is a few feet above what I could reach. It's empty, with no squatty, angry bird in it, and he pries it down off the wall and tosses it to the ground. No egg. Farley trots forward to retrieve the nest, shying away at the angry calls of the birds as she approaches. Harak just cups his hands to his mouth. Climb to the top, fool. That is where the newest nests are. Pashov's tail flicks harder with irritation, but he continues climbing. As I watch, one of his hands gets close to an occupied nest, and the bird squawks angrily and pecks at his hand. Be careful, I call when he switches handholds. Maybe this is a bad idea. I don't know if he can hear me from his vantage point on the wall. I don't want to be a nag or a spoil sport, but at the same time... I'm watching my mate climb, and my concern is growing. Perhaps it's just my fear of heights, but he's climbing really high, and those birds are really pissy. Another snaps at him as he climbs near, and another looks like it wants to take a bite out of his tail. Those are just the ones in the nests, too. If some of the ones perching high on the lip of the canyon get an idea to come and attack, 
It could get ugly. My mate is high off the ground now, at least twenty feet above us. The birds are riled, their angry cawing turning deafening. Some are starting to take to the air, and one swoops at Pashov's back, which elicits a laugh from Harak and Farley and a horrified gasp from me. I suddenly don't want eggs anymore. This doesn't feel safe. I just want Pashov back on the ground so he can put his arm around my waist and I can touch him and smile at him. Nothing else matters. Higher, Harak calls. I want to smack him. Pashov reaches the next empty nest, and his shoulders move a little. He holds something aloft in the air, and it's large, rounded, and a delicate speckled brown. An egg. Great. Now just come down, I whisper. He has to be thirty feet up by now. I'm tired of this. I don't like it. As I watch fearfully, Pashov tucks the egg into the front of his tunic. He pries the nest off the ridge and tosses it to Farley below. Instead of coming down, though, he moves his feet along a ridge of rock, climbing sideways instead of down. He's moving to a nearby empty nest. He reaches into it and then brandishes another egg high into the air with a flourish. My lips twitch with amusement at that. Show off? A bird swoops in from above. It attacks his upraised hand, knocking the egg away. I watch with slow-motion clarity as Pashov leans outward, trying to catch the egg, only to lose his grip on the wall entirely. Then he falls backward onto the canyon floor, and I'm screaming. This is my worst nightmare come to life all over again. I can't lose him again, can I? Please no. Farley, Harak, and I all rush forward, but we won't be in time— Pashov lands on his back with a sickening crash and then lies still. A sob escapes my throat and I fling myself to his side. Pashov! Pashov! I run a hand over his face. His eyes are closed, his body still, and my world feels like it's ending all over again. I grab the front of his tunic and shake him, terrified. Pashov! His eyes open. Pashov gives me a slow smile and cups my face, pulling my mouth to his for a kiss. What the fuck? I rear back, both relieved and shocked, even as Farley and Harak break into laughter. Pashov grins, too. It's not so big a fall, he tells me. My fear gives way to blinding fury. He thinks this is fucking funny? I curl my fingers into a fist and punch him in the shoulder. He shrugs it off, grinning. Do not be mad, Stacy. Not be mad? He just risked his fucking life for a fucking egg, and I nearly lost my mate again, and everyone's laughing and this is funny to them? I punch him again, and then I can't seem to stop hitting him. They're not hard hits. My hands are small, and my strength is crap but I need to get it out of my system before I start screaming and grab a knife and castrate him for being such a dick in this moment. Stacy. Pashov soothes again. It is all right. It is not fucking all right, I say, punctuating my words with slaps. You're an asshole. I jerk to my feet and turn my accusing stare on Farley and Harak, who are still laughing. All of you are assholes. Chompy belches at me. That does it. I am out of here. I feel frustrated and terrified and full of anxiety, and I don't see the humor in this at all. I'm about to start crying, actually, and the last thing I want to do is get all blubbery in their faces. So I turn on my heel and leave. Remember to keep your fingers on the right-hand wall to find your way home, Harek calls after me, amused. I shoot him the bird and continue marching away. Stacy. Pashov jogs after me and grabs at my arm. I shrug his touch away. Leave me alone. I don't want to talk to you right now. You are mad. Oh, understatement of the year. I am fucking furious. Pashov. My mate has used the human curse word more times in the last few minutes than she ever has since I met her. I know this fuck word. It is a very angry one. 
She has only used it a few times in the past, once when she sliced open her finger while dicing roots, and once when Pacey was being born. I... I remember that. Delighted, I jog after my mate. I want to share this with her. But Stacy is marching away, her little back stiff with anger. Her shoulders are shivering. No, wait, that is not shivering. She is crying. She is hurting. I turn back to Harak and Farley, who are equally mystified. What did I do? Farley shrugs, the nests in her arms. She is worried you hurt yourself. Pfft, over that small drop. It left me winded and made my ribs creak, but I have fallen from much worse. It is nothing to panic over. And yet Stacy is upset. Very upset. I have never seen her so furious. Mystified, I stare after her as she marches out of the canyon. Well, my sister prompts. I turn to look at her. Well, what? Are you going to go apologize? She juggles the two nests in her arms, twisting away before Chumpy can grab at one with his teeth. Am I? I pull the frozen egg out of my tunic. It is still whole, rock hard and frozen solid in the frigid weather. Stacy will be pleased, I think. I got this for her. All I wanted to do was make my mate smile. Make her say, yes, Pashav, I want to be your mate again. Please come back to my furs. But those were not the words she said. I am fucking furious. I do not want her upset. I want her smiling and hungry for my kisses. Harak scoops something off the ground and offers it to me. It is the other frozen egg. Go after your mate, he tells me. Quit being a fool. I am being a fool, I echo, surprised. Are you not? You are here talking to us when you should be kissing your mate. He takes one of the nests from Farley's hands, drops the egg into it, then offers both to me with a grin. Go and tell her that you miss her and wish to take her to your furs. Everyone in the hunter cave is tired of your snoring. You should return to your mate. If she will have me, I say, dubious. Farley rolls her eyes. Do not be stupid, brother. Stacy is upset because she worries over you. If she did not care, she would not worry so much. Go chase after her. My sister thinks for a moment, and quickly adds, and tell her that she is pretty. Pretty? A female likes to be told she is attractive. My sister lectures me as if she is the expert. When was the last time you told Stacy you thought she was pretty? I think. And I do not remember if I have told her that at all lately. I grunt acknowledgment. Maybe Farley is right. I put the two frozen eggs in the nest and tuck it under my arm. But what Farley points at me. You are thinking too much. Just go. I do. I turn and jog down the canyon after Stacy. She is now out of sight, which means she is likely walking fast, storming, back to the village. It takes a few moments, but eventually I can see her stiff little back as she marches through the valley alone. She looks very small and lost, my mate. I feel a sense of unhappiness that she is so alone. I should be there at her side, comforting her. Stacy is obviously scared and unhappy about something, and it is my fault. I want to make her smile again. She is also going in the wrong direction to get back to the village. The thought makes me smile because my mate is so sheltered and protected that she cannot even find her way around in a canyon. In that moment I vow that she will always be cared for enough that she will never have to worry about hunting or hiking or getting lost. I will protect her from the world. But first I must get her to stop crying. I think for a minute, then begin to creep up behind her, my steps slow and silent. There is not much snow here in the gorge. Strange, since most of the valleys in our land fill up quickly with snow. But this one is protected by the high lip that keeps the worst of the wind and snow out, and today I am thankful for it. The lack of snow on the rocky ground means that I can move silently without my footsteps crunching. I sneak up on her and watch her swaying backside as she moves. And then I grab it. Stacy emits a shriek so loud that it echoes in the canyon. She jumps around and gives me an incredulous look. What the fuck, Pashov? Oh, the fuck word again. She is very angry. Perhaps that was a mistake. I shrug, trying to play my actions off. I cannot help myself. I am fascinated by your lack of a tail. Her expression changes, softening. She swipes angrily at her cheeks. I'm very mad at you right now. Don't even try to be cute. Am I being cute? She starts to walk away again, and I follow her. Tell me why you are angry, Stacy. She ignores me, still trying to push past. Will you not speak to me? I entreat again. Tell me what I did wrong so I may fix it. I don't want to talk right now, Stacy says, a husky note in her throat, as if she is about to start crying again. 
It tears at me, her unhappiness. It also frustrates me, because how can I know how to fix what I am doing wrong if she never tells me? Is she trying to push me away? To make me seek out another mate? So she can be with someone else? Someone like Harrick? Jealousy gnaws at me, hard and brutal in its intensity. It will not work, I declare, suddenly furious. I will wait for you. She spins around again. Wait for me? What are you talking about? You will not invite me to your bed. You will not let me be your mate. You push me away. It does not matter. I make a slashing motion in the air with my hands. You wait for my memories to come back, but they do not change who I am. They do not change that I am the mate that loves you. They do not change how I feel when I look at you. Stacy stares at me. And how do you feel when you look at me? I move toward her. The urge to touch her is overwhelming. I want to caress her face, stroke her hair. My fingers twitch in response, and I clench my hand tight, pressing it over my heart. Like I am not whole unless you smile. Like the suns rise when you move closer. Like there is nothing sweeter than touching you and hearing your moans of pleasure. At her hesitant smile, I continue. I do not need memories to feel joy when I see you holding my son. I do not need memories to know that there is no greater feeling than sinking my cock deep inside you. I do not need anything in this world but your smile and your heart, Stacy. And that is why I will wait until you invite me back. If it takes twenty seasons, I will wait. She gives a small, confused shake of her head. I don't understand you. If you love me as much as you say you do, why did you leave me and Pacey the moment we got to the village? Because you told me to? Now I am as confused as her. You said you were not ready to take me back as your mate. Not until I had my memories back. I give a small shake of my head. Stacy, I would never push you into something you did not want. I can wait. She presses her hand to her mouth. Oh, my God. What is it? Nothing. I'm so stupid. You are not stupid. You are wonderful. She flings herself into my arms and clings to my neck. Her mouth seeks mine, and I toss aside the nest with the frozen eggs in it to grab my mate's rounded bottom. I haul her against me and hold her close as we kiss, our tongues melting together. Does this mean you will take me as your mate again? I ask between fierce, nipping kisses. She nods quickly and kisses me again, then bites at my lower lip in a way that makes my cock ache. Thought you didn't want me. That was why you left. I groan. If I did not want you, why would it make me so crazy every time Harrick pays attention to you? I tear at her tunic, at the knot under her breasts that holds it wrapped shut. To my surprise, she laughs. He said he was trying to make you jealous. I couldn't figure out why. I guess he wants us back together, too. She leans in and runs the tip of her tongue along my lower lip. That's kind of sweet. As long as that is all he wants, I growl, feeling possessive. This is my female, my mate, and I've waited long enough to claim her again. I kiss her deeply, even as I pull her tunic open. She gasps against me, peeking around. The others? Someone will see us. You went the wrong way to get back to the village, I tell her, pressing my mouth to her neck. She is so soft here, so sweet. Make enough noise, and they will know to stay away. Her shocked giggle tells me that she is not displeased with the thought. I slide my hand between the layers of clothing and find her breast, plump and delicious. She moans at my touch, and her kisses take on a more fevered edge. I am going to make her mine, right here, right on the canyon floor. I like the idea so much that I immediately drop to my knees. Stacy squeaks in surprise, but does not protest when I pull her down with me. I continue kissing her bared skin, feverishly undoing the ties on her leggings, and then mine. Right here? she asks softly. Right here, I agree. I have waited endless days for you. I am hungry to be inside you, for us to become one again. Her hand strokes my face. Me too. My mouth is on hers in the next moment, my tongue slicking against her smooth, soft one. Everything about my mate is soft and gentle, and it fills me with a fierce protectiveness as well as hunger. In the next moment her leggings are down and her freed leg hooks around my hip. I sink into her warmth, marveling at how perfect, how incredible she feels. Stacy gasps, her eyes going wide. She feels tight around my cock, her cunt slick with heat and ready for me. My mate, I growl fiercely. My Stacy. Yours, she trembles under me, tearing at my clothing as if desperate to touch my skin. All yours. I thrust into her again, my cock buried deep inside her, my spur sliding along her folds. 
She cries out as I do, and I lean down to give her another claiming kiss. I am going to take you hard, my mate, I tell her, hard and fast. She nods, eager. I stroke into her once more and begin to pump with quick, decisive movements. It is as if her permission has freed me. It has also stolen my control. Over and over I pound into her, Stacy's little cries fueling me. I claim her with swift ferocity, and when her cunt begins to clench hard around my cock, I feel a near-brutal satisfaction as she cries out her pleasure. Mine comes but moments later. Afterward she caresses my face with her small hands and cold fingers, as if marveling at what we have just done. A happy smile plays on her mouth, and I press a kiss to her bountiful breasts, feeling lazy and content. Her hands move to my mane, and she plays with my hair, then touches my broken horn. You're sure the fall earlier did not hurt you? Not at all. I am sorry it frightened you, though. I just thought... I thought it was happening all over again. She shudders underneath me. That I was going to lose you once more. Never. You will never be rid of me. I wrap my arms tightly around her torso. Every day I will bury myself so deeply inside you that your qui will send its regards. She chuckles, her fingertips grazing over my brows. As long as you are in my furs every night, that is fine with me. Every night, I agree. I slide my hand under her bottom and stroke the pale curve of flesh. No tail here, I murmur, patting her backside. Stacy stills under me. You... did you remember? Remember what? I look up at her. A flash of disappointment crosses her face, but is quickly gone. Nothing. I guess it's not important after all. I did remember something earlier, I tell her, that you used the word fuck when Pacey was being born, and that you did not tell me of this when you shared the story of his birth. Her smile widens. It wasn't my most ladylike moment. You really remembered that? I nod. I did. I think the memories will come back in time if you are patient with me. Of course, she says, and touches my mouth with her soft little fingertips. You and I are forever. I like the sound of that very much. I agree. She gives a contented sigh, and I wish we could stay right here like this forever. I squeeze her bottom again. I would wish that too, my mate, except you need to make your mate and your son an egg. An egg? Her brows draw together. Then she sits up so quickly that her head almost bangs into mine. Oh, my God, you saved the eggs? They are frozen, and the shells are hard, I tell her, rolling off of her soft body. I lie on my back and tie my breeches, tucking my cock back into my clothing. I have two of them for you. Her squeal of delight warms me down to my toes. Epilogue Stacy Two Months Later Pacey bounces on his hands and knees, tail flicking. Across the room, my mate sits on the floor, cross-legged. He waves his fingers at his son, indicating he should come forward. You can do it, Pacey. Pashov calls out. Come to Dada. He uses the English word, or a bastardized version of it, since Pacey seems to be able to say that easier than the Saqui father, which has a lot of swallowed syllables. The baby plants one foot on the ground, then the other, his bottom wiggling in the air. Then he stands upright. I stir my egg while it slow roasts on the fire. After endless experimenting, I've figured out the best way to cook the frozen dirt beak eggs. Crack open the top and let it scramble in its own shell, occasionally stirring it. It makes a mountain of perfect, delicious scrambled eggs that go amazingly well with a bit of knot potato and is my favorite go-to meal when I'm tired of dried meat. Pashov is taken to eating the eggs, too, but he prefers his as more of an omelet peppered with chunks of meat and roots. They've helped save my sanity so far in the brutal season, when there's plenty to eat, but most of it is dried, smoked meat. The hunters filled our storage coffers as much as possible before the weather got bad, and the women harvested a lot of knot potato, and now we're just riding out the blizzards above, snug in our little nook in the ground below. I have an entire storage area full of frozen eggs, and we're all being extremely careful to make them last. We should be good through the brutal season, after all, and the men only go out to hunt on the days that it's not pouring snow. Since most days are so cold that it hurts to breathe and the skies are so dark they look like a bruise, the hunters stay home with us a lot of the time. And while the food's a bit monotonous, I don't mind it. 
because I enjoy having Pashov around all day. He gets to spend quality time with his son, like right now. Pacey stretches out his little arms and wobbles forward on one foot, then the other. I hold my breath. Is he? He has it, Pashov says proudly and gestures for Pacey to come forward. You can do it, little one. Dada, Pacey says, staggering forward. He only makes it a few steps before he falls into Pashov's arms, but my mate laughs and catches him, then tosses him into the air as if my son has made the greatest accomplishment ever. Did you see that? Pashov asks me, between Pacey's peals of laughter. Three steps this time. He'll be running up and down the streets soon, I say with pride in my voice. My little son is so smart. I don't know a lot about babies, but it seems to me he's always just a little ahead of the other kits in the tribe. Or maybe that's just my mommy side speaking. Whatever it is, I'm proud of my clever little Pacey. Pashov grins over at me and gently sets Pacey back down. The baby immediately tries to get on his feet again, reaching for his father. You'd better hurry up and eat, I admonish him as I use a pair of bone tongs to take the egg off the fire. Josie will be here soon, and she's been having pregnancy cravings for eggs. You can cook her up another, my mate says lazily, scooping up my son and shooting me a heated look that tells me breakfast isn't the only thing on his mind right now. He carries Pacey over to the playpen Hamelow recently made for him, a series of privacy screens interlocked together to make a safe area for him to play, and comes to my side. He nuzzles at my neck and his hands slide over my ass. Frisky this morning, I tease, breathless. I'm feeling it, too. I am just imagining how my mate will react when she sees the gift I have for her, he teases, nipping at my ear and sending skitters of pleasure through my body. Gift? But the holiday's not until next month. We've already talked a bit about it as a tribe, and last year it broke up the brutal season so delightfully well that Claire's already planning out days and days of activities to keep things exciting through the long, snowy weeks. I know, but I cannot wait any longer for you to have it. But your food... It can wait. My eyes go wide at that. It's not like my walking, talking stomach of a mate to push aside food. This must be good, then. Oh, it is. He gives my butt one last caress and heads over to the far side of our little house, where the rolled-up furs are waiting for curing. Curious, I watch as he digs through the bundles and pulls out something flat and wrapped in leather. He turns around and holds it out to me, a smile on his face. I'm touched that he's so thoughtful and I can't stop grinning. A present feels like such a treat especially since we're all being so careful with goods after losing almost everything to the cave-in. Even months later, making do has become the new normal. But we'll survive it because we always do, and we'll eventually replenish everything we lost. Are you sure? I ask shyly, taking the leather-wrapped object from him. I don't have anything to give you. I'm making him a soft, fur-lined tunic on the sly, but it won't be ready until the holiday. Just having you as my mate is gift enough, he says, and cups my face to give me a kiss. Aw, that is sweet. You're totally getting laid later, I tease, and my thrumming quee seems to agree. I pull the leather off of it, and I gasp in surprise. It's a skillet. It's not quite the same as the one I had before, but it's made similarly. It has a bone handle attached to a square piece of metal salvaged from the ship, with the sides bent upward to form a lip. The handle on my old skillet had been soldered, but this one is interlocking, with a bit of leather tied around to keep it in place. Do you like it? Pashov asks. Harlow says we will have to change out the handle and the leather thong every few turns of the moon, but I thought it a small price to pay to get it for you again. It's wonderful, I say dreamily, running my hand over the surface and it's going to make cooking so much easier again. I give him a happy look. You remembered? He nods, the expression on his face shy. It is another memory that came back. Once I had it, I wanted to ask Harlow about getting you another. I was lucky she had a few pieces of metal left. You're wonderful, I tell him. I'm truly touched. 
not just because it's the most thoughtful, perfect gift ever, but because more of his memories are creeping back. He's sensitive about them because I know that he's frustrated it's taking more time than he wanted. But we're together and happy, and his nightmares have stopped now that we sleep in the furs together every night. I don't mind waiting a little longer for the last of his memories. And if he never gets them back, I don't even care anymore. I have my Pashov. That's all that matters. I wanted to make my mate happy, he says simply. You do. Every day you do. I set it down on my stool and move forward to put my arms around his neck. My quee's purring furiously, and I'm feeling more than a little turned on. And it's not just because of the gift. It's because he's so thoughtful and wonderful and utterly sexy, and I love the way he looks at me. He pulls me against him, and I can feel my breasts bounce when my body hits his. His quee is loud, too, and I reach between us to caress his cock. It's hard as a rock already, even through the leather of his breechcloth. I see someone's been thinking long and hard about his reward for making his mate so happy. I say playfully, my voice a throaty purr. I cannot help it. You are irresistible to me. He leans down and grazes his mouth over mine in a gentle kiss. Shall I see if Asha can watch our son for a time and give us some privacy? So I can show you how much I like your skillet? His eyes gleam. Yes. By making you eggs? His mouth curves into a wicked smile. Only if you allow me to eat them off of your stomach. You strange, kinky man, I say with a laugh. It's open for negotiation. He leans in to kiss me again, and suddenly, I feel it. Resonance. The loud, pleasant hum of my quee changes tone, becomes louder, more insistent. His sings loudly to mine, the joined song so loud it feels as if it's filling our small little house and shaking my body. I gasp, clinging to him. Resonance! Again? Again, he says happily, and claims my mouth in a ravenous kiss. And oh, God, it feels feels as if my face is going to melt off from the fury of that kiss. It's wicked and delicious and so deep and wet that I can feel my entire body turning into an inferno. I know what to expect from resonance now that it's the second time around, but time hasn't dampened the feeling. The ache between my legs is insistent and intense, and my nipples feel like tight, aching little buds that are just begging to be licked for a few hours. Pashoff groans as he kisses me. You are incredible. Each word is punctuated with another heated kiss. We will have another kit, he marvels. A daughter this time, one that looks like you. I laugh, rubbing his cock through his breeches because I can't help myself. Or another son. I'm fine with either, as long as it's healthy. Or both, like Nora. Okay, slow it down there, big guy, I warn. Let's not count our chickens before they hatch. Hmm, I do not know what you just said, but it is arousing. He leans down and traces his tongue along my earlobe. Shall I take our son to Asha, then, so we can get to work making our next son? I cling to him because his tongue is doing magical things to my ear and I might just collapse into a puddle of overheated goo if he continues. Not that I ever want him to stop. Ask her to keep him overnight. If she can't, then your mother. His eyes gleam as our gazes meet. You think it will take all night? Well, we just want to be sure, I say coyly, and give his cock another stroke. He's rigid under my grip but he can throw on his winter layers and no one will notice the stiffness under the layers. Hurry, though. I have never seen a man move so fast as he scoops up our son and the small pack we keep full of his loincloth changes and toys and flings his leather wraps on before hurrying out the door. I giggle, watching him head down the cobbled icy street, and then I touch my belly. 
another baby, another kit. My perfect little family is growing and I'm excited. No, ecstatic. I think of the pleased look on my Pashov's face and pull the tie free from my braid, humming happily to myself. Memories aren't a problem, I've been realizing over time. We can always make new ones. And as long as we're together, every day is a new opportunity to love and be happy. Sometimes, that's all you need. This concludes Barbarian's Heart by Ruby Dixon. Narrated by Holly Jackson and Mason Lloyd. Copyright 2016 by Ruby Dixon. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Ruby Dixon, Care of Root Literary, and was produced in the year 2018 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audio.